In 2019, I decided to pick up my camera again. I was in remission from cancer and it was a right time for me to revisit a passion from my art A-level days. I've been working on photography projects ever since. In 1987, I visited the Hayward Gallery. I bought a postcard from the gallery shop and it changed my understanding of photography. It was a photo by Chris Killip and showed two figures braced against the wind on a coal cart. The photograph is bleak but hopeful and had a strong emotional effect on me. According to Siankovic, people can be highly moved by art which may stir negative feelings. We can allow ourselves to be moved by this in a safe way, which in turn is meaningful to us as we reflect on our own feelings. Before that, I'd only been exposed to photography in family albums and regional newspapers. I'd never engaged with photography on an emotional level. In his book, Camera Lucida, Bartz refers to this as punctum, a feeling that is intensely subjective. I'd discovered a new depth to photography and I wanted to create images that inspired empathy. In my work, I like to find something hidden that might otherwise not be seen or spoken. I think this came originally from a desire to understand myself. As I've got older, my personal awareness has grown and with it, an understanding and appreciation of art. This was the catalyst that inspired me to create Sober Exposure in 2019, a photographic exhibition that explores sobriety on university campuses, which is currently touring universities in the UK. It was a steep learning curve. I'd never made a portrait before, so I immersed myself in literature and photo books. I read Susan Sontag, Robert Adams and studied Diane Arbus's portraits. I learnt the skill of making my own opportunities and secured exhibition space in the first university. I used street photography to learn new techniques. It taught me manual operation of my camera, how to think on my feet and notice light, colour and movement. As I grew in confidence and approached strangers to make street portraits, I learnt to assert myself behind the camera and began to appreciate the two-way process. Sorowski describes this using a window and mirror analogy, but to me the process of making an image with a subject feels more like an unspoken two-way conversation. I find myself less interested in making street photographs now, unless it's part of a series. I soon realised that the part of street photography I was enjoying was the increased connection with my local community. So, for my next project, I chose to work with a local charity that provides drop-in services for the homeless. It was a great opportunity to work on a longer-term documentary project. I spent a lot of time with the clients over a period of about 10 months. The project was called Under One Roof and was exhibited in July this year. It presented lots of challenges. I wasn't used to working with this client group, but found that my background in mental health nursing helped. Most importantly, I wanted to make authentic portraits that the clients liked and could look at with pride. I was interested in the concepts of truth and reality in portraits. I realised that I could capture a truth, one rooted in the moment. Bogra discusses the concept of truth and reality. Although the images are not the truth, the indexical relationship between the lens and the object does capture some moments of reality with the photographer supplying the rest because documentary is an interpretive genre. Under One Roof required a lot of research and even more sensitivity. I was conscious of being an outsider. I didn't want to create portraits that patronised the subjects or exploited the homeless stereotype. I acknowledged the ethical issues and recognised there was a power imbalance. I made sure I had plenty of time to get to know the clients and the service. In my view, photographing vulnerable people can and should encourage transparency in the work. I invited discussion on any aspect of it. Mikhailov photographed homeless people in his series Case History. He said that it would have been unethical to photograph them candidly. Communication was necessary. 
there arose a need to overcome some inner resistance. If you can communicate with them, then it means you can cross some sort of boundary. Mikhailov believed he was ethical in his approach. However, he has been subsequently criticised for his methods. In her book, Photography, A Cultural History, Marian says that Mikhailov paid hungry and homeless people to pose for him and that the pictures remain controversial because of what some people perceive as the camera's cold-eyed stare at helpless people. In his book on photographing people and communities, Bay talks about transcending the differences between photographer and subject when working with a community the photographer doesn't belong to. I was reassured by his words. Even when you're a part of the community you're photographing, you may not be able to see it clearly and end up making something overly sentimental. No matter your position, inside or outside, it's a question of intention. I knew that my intention was good, so I had the confidence to trust the process. Having recently read Burbridge and Levera's article on photography and participation, I would now probably pay more attention to what participation and collaboration actually means. Many of Levera's ideas are about positioning the work so that the participants are not treated as objects to be looked at in a gallery space. His methodology considers a broader view and discusses the relationship between funders, facilitators, artists and participants in more material terms. Bartz explores this idea further in Camera Lucida. Photography transforms the subject into object, or a subject who feels they are becoming an object. To mitigate this effect, it seemed ethical to me to involve the participant in all stages of the project. I'm going to revisit this project and put the power back in the participants' hands by creating a calendar that features their photographs. My research project is called On These Magic Shores and is an exploration of play in primary school aged children. The motivation for this project is different to my previous work. As Nichols says, documentaries are about something that actually happened, about real people and tell stories about what happens in the real world. This was partly true of my previous work, but it was more about the individual and their story. I wanted to understand other people and give them a voice. For On These Magic Shores, I'm going to adopt a more research-based practice. I'm really excited about this new direction and looking forward to finding out where the project takes me.